Well, hello and welcome. It is May. Happy spring. Today on Brian Breaks Character, I have a guest that I've known for quite a few years, actually. Uh, you'll know this as soon as she starts talking. Helen is from England, uh, and she is a actress, a voiceover artist, a circus performer. She's a puppeteer and a performance capture artist, and she now lives in Los Angeles. So if you're an actor who is tuning in from anywhere other than the United States, her story will be particularly exciting to hear because she shares how she got representation here, boots on the ground in Los Angeles. So if you're somewhere else in the world and you'd like to have representation in the United States, lean in, turn up, grab the notebook. Also, if you are someone who's had a non-traditional career as a performer, you've got a dance background, you also are a puppeteer, Helen's background, you'll see how it's all funneled into this beautiful, I would say like Madra's print of doing different things in her career and saying yes to them without it becoming overwhelming or feeling like she's cheating on different parts of her passion. So she was full time on the road with Cirque du Soleil in Taruk, which was James Cameron's like avatar version of a Cirque du Soleil show. Uh, and then she also has worked with Henson Studios here in Los Angeles, of course, home of the Muppets. I feel like we all, at least I grew up with Jim Henson shows, right? Uh, and she's been on video games such as major AAA games like Forspoken. So in this conversation, I want you to listen for a few things. One, how did she make it happen to come from England to the US? How did she make her what seemed like disparate career into a through line? How did she land the representation here? And then also the consciousness that she brought to uprooting herself from another country and landing with her feet firmly planted on the ground and ready to work. One more thing you need to know about Helen is that she is such a delight and I love her so much. She's really generous with sharing her feelings, her experiences, and what got in the way, how, the lessons that she's learned. So I hope you will enjoy getting to meet her today on the episode. Helen Day, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to be here. I'm so glad you are. So, Helen, let's give everyone a little history lesson on how we met and how we've been working together a little bit. So we did this really quickly before we started recording today, but can you take me back to the first time I met you? Okay. So it was actually one of my first times in LA. I think it was my second time in LA. I kind of decided that maybe I wanted to move here. So I did um, a sort of four-day workshop intro for actors to Los Angeles and you were coaching a session during that four day workshop. We met casting directors, we met agents right. and we met you. And um, you did this session that was kind of revelatory to me because it was all about how to introduce yourself and make sure that you get some wins in there. And as a Brit, I looked at that and I was like, I need that because <laughs> I think we're a little pre-programmed to kind of go, I'm so sorry for taking up space. I'm mm. doing nothing interesting. Don't listen to me. And <laughs> you were the antithesis of that. And I was like, I want to work with this guy. So that was 2016. I was on tour at the time. I didn't move here till 2019. Um, oh. But yeah, just before I moved here, I contacted you and said, can I work with you? And thankfully you said yes. Oh, I love it. I love it. And uh, I think so. A couple of things I want to make sure no one misses is I think that what trip was with Next Level or One on One, isn't that right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And if, if anyone's listening and you don't know that resource, I think that they they do a really great job with a trip in Los Angeles. And I also think they do one in New York, in there, in New York and in LA. It's called and they do one an Atlanta one, one as well. Oh, great. They do yeah. it. That's right. They do it. Like, right. So, uh, and I teach for them every time they come to LA. And so this is, that's how we met totally. And then we be you became. Uh, a private client and we would see each other pretty often. I remember this is when I used to live in Los Feliz. So you came to my little mm -hmm. bungalow at the time, right? Um, and Helen, what I can tell you is, you know, we were excited about getting you new reps in a new town and a new city. And I, it, you were one of the very, for, for, for long time listeners, you already know about agent goals already, but agent goals is my program that helps people get agents, but it had not been invented yet. It, but Helen was one of the first people that I like did it on, right? It, she was like, she didn't know she was a beta test. I didn't know she was a beta <laughs> test. I just knew I was like, this is how I think we're going to go about this. And we, that's how we got your first reps in LA. I think, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, well, totally. the the first ones I'd already been talking to actually since the since the one trip. on one trip. I'd actually kept that conversation going for three years. So what you did with me then, I, I when I arrived in LA, I hadn't actually signed with them. Um, but I was having my I had a meeting set up and you just leveled me out because I think I arrived and I was like this meeting is everything <laughs> and these people are everything and I need I to go in and wow them. And you were like, 
calm down. These are human beings. You gave me some exercises to do in the car before I went in and and just you made it a more human experience for me and kind of grounded me. Um, but then kind of fairly quickly, just with one thing and another, I, I signed across the board with an agency. And then I was like, OK, I think actually I need management and actually uh -huh. I want to split off theatrically and do something else there. And you really helped me reach out and, and find reps using the method that is now right. tried and tested. Right. Yes. Well, and, and thanks for being my guinea pig when I didn't know you were guinea pig. I was just doing, this is what I think, I know this is going to work. So it worked, but wait, but what I also want to make sure everyone's hearing, everyone knows this by now you're listening to Helen's not pretending to have an accent right now. This is Helen's real talking voice. She's not working on her accent <laughs> skills on this podcast today. So I'm sure there's some people who are curious <laughs> about the- I wish I was. I wish <laughs> <was> really good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm sure there's some people who are curious about just a little bit of the experience of coming from another country and coming to the States and the possibility and what needed to be in place beforehand. Can you speak into that a little bit? Because I speak to a lot of actors who will say either, should I do agent goals or should I move to the States or what can I do? Like, how can I make it happen also there? And kind of the converse as well, which I don't think you have as, as much experience with, but like, I'm going to go to London and try to get work, right? So can you tell us about your version of coming here and how it kind of worked for you? Absolutely. I mean, I can only speak to my experience, so I'm sure there's a million different ways to do it. Um, I decided I wanted to move here, like I say, in 2016. At the time, I was on tour with Cirque du Soleil, and um, that first agent that I had an initial meeting with, and they said, well, we're not going to sign you because you're not here, but, you know, maybe when you are here, they said, oh, maybe you can get an O-1 visa. So I went to see a lawyer, and he actually said, well, he looked at everything that I have, where I've come from, sort of where I was working and said, kind of, you may as well go for the green card. Mm. So I started that uh, in motion and I feel really lucky that I wasn't in a particular hurry because I had a touring job. I right, had a performing right, right, job. Right, right, I, yeah. I, I wasn't kind of going, I've booked a flight in X number of months and <gasps> let's hope that green card comes through. Right. So it, it because it was quite a lot to get it together. You have to get lists of recommendation. You have to kind of prove your metal, if you like. Um, and and so I did all of that kind of at a nice pace and, and worked with a lawyer to do that and, and get that all submitted. Again, very lucky that I got that green card. So that right. was in place before I came. I think that's a huge part of it is just having, knowing that you can actually come here and work right. and survive. Um, yeah. Because I have, seen friends and colleagues people that have come across kind of come here without a visa and it's just like this huge block in the of, of course i'm sure there are lucky stories where someone doesn't have the right to work and then a producer just goes you're amazing and, right. and plucks them out but i just think that's gonna make it so much so much more chance and luck well, um, oh wait and also helen i just think about the anxiety level of this is going to run out. And I'm not saying that plenty of people do this and this is the path that you have to take in order to get your green card. Not everyone can have the same path that Helen had, but I also say mm -hmm. it, it, yes, you lucked out. And I want to just be really mindful for oh, one people. I don't have a lot of experience with this, but the actors that I do have known have done it. Like you can't just come and get a job doing something else now because the only work you're allowed to get is in the performing space. And so it gets a really tricky and tight when it comes to finances and how you're providing for yourself. And then there's an extra pressure of a better freaking book work as an actor, because that's all I can book and how am I going to make some money? So, uh, I'm, I was really grateful you had that graceful experience. I just want to make sure anyone who's listening also knows like it doesn't necessarily mean your O1 is going to be bad. I've had plenty of clients who actually have had their agents sponsor them as they get their work. Right. But it's tricky. I think it's, it's tricky. And there, it's, it's a, to me, I feel like it's a, you're willingly saying, I'm going to say yes to some more unpredictability beyond mm. my acting career in some way. Just wanted to underline that, I think, for people who yeah. are thinking about it. Yeah, right. And I, and I think I'm, I'm a great believer in it doesn't do us any favor as actors or performers to walk into an audition space with a sense of need. And it's mm. very hard not to because we you kind of always do. want the job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, to try and get rid of as much of that need as possible. And I think if you're like, I need this because otherwise I can't eat. Yeah. Because I can't do any other work. That's just a huge amount of pressure and a huge amount that we're then putting on ourselves um, yeah. extra as actors. Um, but then once I had that in place, I, I also tried to make sure that I was putting down links here. So like talking to you was one of the links I, I was sort of putting down, knowing that I had someone I could hit the ground running with mm. that could 
hold my hand and go, this is the industry here, because it's so different to the industry in London and back home. Um, the way relationships work are different, the way, actually some of the nuts and bolts, the way auditions work are different, what's expected of you. Headshots are different, or they certainly, they're, I think they've leveled out a bit now, but when I first yeah. came here, I had I had a black and white 10 by eight, separate from a CV as we call it. Right. <laughs> people were like, what are you doing? Wait, we don't even call them 10 by eights, we call them eight by tens. <laughs> there you go, there you go. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's just trying to uh, put down those links. Linking with you was one thing. Linking with an agent, so I had someone that I was at least talking to. Mm -hmm. And then kind of, I visited here multiple times before I actually made the move so that I kind of had a little bit of a sense of the city. I mean, Got I was it. in the lucky position of being able to do that. And again, I think everyone has a different route and everyone has a, a different way in. Um, but I was glad that when I arrived, I kind of knew North, South, East, West, kind of knew roughly where I wanted to live. I had some people that I had connections with. And also I did have some money. I'd right. saved up. You've been on tour years. too. You've been on tour, which can sometimes be a good time to bank a little bit, depending on the kind of tour that you're on or whatever. Right. Yeah. yeah. And then um, also Helen, I want to just make sure everyone hears this. You were, tell me if this is wrong. I'm making a, a assumption here is when you're on tour, you're like, I'm in a new city. I'm in a new, like you've you build a, a rhythm of I'm in a new city and I'm used to being in a new city and like a little bit of an extra I don't want to say like sense of adventure or a little bit of extra of like I can go out and find the things I need to find because I've been in tours. So like there's like a muscle built there where if you came, this is not necessarily just an introvert uh, uh, characteristic, but if you came to LA like, okay, I got here and I'm scared to leave my house or I'm, I'm scared to leave the sublet that I'm in. Like there's, you, there's, there's the, what you heard, what I heard you say is I built like I had Brian as a link. I had this agent as a link. I had a little bit of money as a way to keep me from feeling a little too stressed out about things. The it's almost like a form of self-care in, in a in a situation where it's brand new Absolutely. in some ways. Yeah, yeah, right. Absolutely, yeah. And I think arriving with that mindset, as you say, coming off tour of just like, I, I'd i made, I think we went to 128 different cities in the four-year tour that I did. And every one, you kind of go, right, I'm going to make it work. I'm going to find out what's interesting here. I'm going to meet some interesting people here. I'm going to see the thing here. And kind of arriving with that mindset of, I can do it was really useful. I mean, that that's, again, that serendipity that I had that experience just before arriving here. But I also think that's a mindset that you can work yourself into and totally. kind of remind yourself that if you're moving to a new place, you're going to have to kind of go out and get it. Yeah. You know, if, if you're coming from the States and going to London, it's going to be the same thing. London isn't going to come find you. You're going to have to go out and make it work. Well, I'm just going to, I'm going to go on a little side tangent here right now. Cause you just reminded me of when I first moved to LA and I think it's important to light up your curiosity when you're in a new place and your curiosity can go towards the things you care about. So like if you're moving in a new city and you're a big reader, you're like, well, what's the cutest little mom and pop bookshop nearby that has a book club or whatever. Or like I'm a super foodie and I want to find like, what is the restaurants that I'm going to really get into while I'm here? Whatever. I remember when I first moved to LA, I started a, a blog that was called Bry Coastal Curious because I just moved from New York. <laughs> and I remember I was like, what wild street names like La Cienega and Coenga. And I was like, like two of those so different from what I grew up with, right? And growing up in Ohio, right? Uh, and so I just, I think that what you're describing is it's a difference between you're on vacation and when you're going to make it your new home that you get to start to like embrace or own the things around you. Okay, let's not get too far mm. down that my sidebar here, but I thought I'd share a little bit. So I love it. Uh, so you came you with your green card, and I'll just say, as when we were reaching out, one of the things that we led with in our messaging was, I can totally work here. Like, I am a U.S. citizen or what? We might, I think that wasn't the exact language you used because when you have a green card, it's not the same as when you're – it's like there's a step in between, I think, that we were – yeah, I'm not right. a citizen, but as a green card holder, I can work. And we made that right. really clear at the top right. of the email. Right. And and I want everyone to just hear that, like, if you are the person coming from another country, uh, this also works for another market, but like by calling those kind of things out, it makes the person who's reading it feel safe that they can decide to become interested in you. Because what they don't want is a bait and switch where suddenly, like, oh, and by the way, I can't work, or I'm working on getting my visa, or I'm working on getting my work permit. I think that is going to inspire doubt in anyone you're reaching out to. And so they're like, oh, I don't have time. To, I don't know this person yet. Like, unless they're like of an extraordinary talent, like uh, you have something really wild that no one on the roster could possibly have. then that's kind of where I think that can break through. Um, 
And you had some great, but also Helen, you had some really great cool street cred because you'd just been on tour for Cirque du Soleil for some Taruk, 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 which was James Cameron's show based on Avatar. So you had that kind of mm-hmm. good, sexy cachet going on. Okay. So you do have a unique, really cool skill that I wanted to talk to you a little bit about today that, sure. we're, that we've been kind of working on. Is there, wait, before I go there, is there anything missing from the agent story that we need to share a manager story? What, wait, can I tell you something that I love to share? I'm going to tell you something I love sure, to share. Sure, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, go ahead. Uh, and just so that you know, we're, this, we're recording this at about three, Agent Goals is now three years old. Uh, and so that means that over uh, 7,000 people have watched Make Agents Want You, which is really exciting to me because that's just brain changing. Like if you take my program or not, that's brain changing. But one of the stories that I share is a part of your story, which I know we made a shift in this representation, but at the time your manager went with you to your headshot shoot. And I just remember mm-hmm. thinking that yeah. was like the cool, like that is such a rare thing. Can you give us a window into how that came to be just a little bit? I know that's not necessarily where you're at right now, but still, I think the story of it is cool. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, you, you'd helped me reach out to managers and, and I'd found my first manager in LA, which for a start was weird for me because we don't have managers in Britain. So it's like, what is a manager? Oh, wow. I, I think I want one of these things that people have. <laughs> but, I, <laughs> but why do I want it? So I, anyway, you, you'd help me reach out. And I found that reaching out experience so much more pleasant than any other time I tried to get an agent previously because again I think previously I'd always done it from a mindset of kind of need and desperation and 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 please like me and please if there's a chance can I just you know that kind of like needy needy thing that that we just develop I think as actors because we know there's loads of us and we kind of hear you know oh nobody works and kind of we hear a lot of no's so we develop that needy thing and, and I'd always done that and it just felt really unpleasant and kind of a gross part of being an actor. And then this time I had this email that I was really proud of, what that I thought was really me, that really showed me where I am, that mm. wasn't overselling or pretending to be something that I'm not or that I wasn't. And so when I went into those meetings, I think I just felt different about myself. Like mm. I was, again, I wasn't then coming into those meetings from a place of need I was kind of coming in going well you know what I had to say you know where I'm coming from you've called me into this meeting so let's talk um and it that experience is so more human and it's that's one of the reasons I wanted to be on this side of the Atlantic because I think relationships are more important here and are, are given more kudos and I just wanted to live in a world of of relationships and interaction rather than in a world of please may I write you a letter and maybe you'll reply if you want me. You know, it it just felt more like this is a two-way street. And so, yeah, I went into those meetings feeling good about myself, good about what I was bringing to the table. Um, I signed with my first manager. And I think because of that very much kind of human, we're equals, we're doing this together relationship that we instantly have. That's why she she was like, I'm going to come to your headshot shoot. Let's make this work. Let's let's do something brilliant here. So, so I love yeah, that. Um, I love that. That came out of the relationship and not coming in with a please, please. like me state yeah. of mind. I love you. There's two things you said here. I don't want to miss one is I didn't know that one of the reasons that you wanted to come to the States was because you wanted there to be deeper relationships. And that mm. was what you had discovered. Can you talk a little bit more about that or how that thought came to you? Is it in, is it looking back that you realize that or is it, did you know at the time? Um, I knew it once I'd started visiting Los Angeles and meeting people. I didn't know it when I first had the idea, but when I was like, okay, I'm going to investigate. I'm going to put some feet on the ground here and see what it's like, see if I like it. Um, and I, I had some meetings with people. I, I, did the workshop that I met you at. I also had some meetings with a few casting directors that I'd reached out to that said, yeah, come in, sure. And all of those meetings just felt more human than the meetings that Mm. I'd had before. And maybe that is part of where I was at in myself and a certain amount of growth as an individual. But I I think also it is, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to do Britain down. I don't want them to say they won't have me back if I want to go back. (laughs) Right. But, um, but I do think we we love a hierarchy in Britain. Mm. You know, I mean, we you we, are a monarchy, we still, <laughs> right? We still have a royal family, so there you go. We we love a hierarchy, and I found it more stay in your lane 
then I found mm. the industry here. And that was one thing that I found really appealing was, okay, I think I can go and I can meet people and I can network and I can feel again, like a human rather than like a, a, a needy actor kind of crawling around looking for yeah. scraps. Yeah. You know? I love that. I love that. And then the other thing I want to make sure everyone hears is, you know, there's a different way, like a manager come, I'm coming to your headshot shoot because I'm going to tell you how it could be done, which was not the vibe of this, which was, I think if you became no. in as the needy, I was like, let's make this the best it can be. And I just think that's such a cool, I think so many people be like, are you kidding? I think also some people might be intimidated by their manager being there. What was the actual vibe like when you were shooting? Oh no, it was great. I mean, yeah. I think if I'd if I'd have felt intimidated by her being there, then I would have gone, this is not the right person for me to work with. Mm. Um, and I think that is something that you kind of instilled in me or or that came out of our conversations was, you know, it's it's not just about somebody saying yes to you, it's you saying yes to them. Everybody underline you- that and tattoo it on your heart. Please, please. We are not searching for scraps here. Yeah, you're you're starting from a, an equal place. You're starting from a strong springboard board together, rather than in that what just one way street. What can I do for you? And and okay, you've you've said yes to desperate little me, and and it just felt I felt taller, I felt broader, I felt more myself, and and yeah, I, I think that's that's why it was a great experience yeah, her coming great. along to the shoot. Good. I'm so glad to hear that. I think a lot of people will be excited by that. Now, I want to get into this other thing. I teased you all a minute ago about what <laughs> Helen's other special skill, this really incredible special skill. And I would say it's beyond a special skill because I think it's inherently part of who you are, Helen, based on the background that you have. So will you talk a little bit about your movement experience and kind of uh, your movement passions, let's say it that way, and also mm. what, what, we're, what we've been kind of working towards, if you'll share a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um I mean, to wind back, I started my career as a dancer. I, I danced for a, a couple of years at the, the very, very start when I was performing and then kind of quite quickly moved into physical theater, kind of picked up some circus, was doing puppetry, a lot of theater work, but from a very kind of physical point of view. And I've always been drawn to work where I can be physically expressive. It just kind of sits well with me. I, I feel good when I'm moving. I'm, I gesticulate a lot. Um, <laughs> Everyone go to YouTube a... so you can see Helen gesticulating a lot. <laughs> I'm a mover. Yeah. Um, but I did come to LA to focus on on screen, which when I decided to make that jump, I was very much like, oh, that's film and television. And then when I got here, I'm not sure quite what it was that made me realize um, that actually motion and performance capture was going to be something that interested me. But once I made that link, I thought back to a workshop that we'd done when I was on tour with Cirque. We, we were, as you said, we were um, to Rook, which was based on Avatar. So we got to work with James Cameron, which was amazing. And at, when we'd been on tour in LA, we'd been taken to the Lightstorm Studios and he'd done a workshop with us talking about the performance capture technology. And at the time, I'd kind of gone... Everyone oh, right now who's listening is like salivating. Their ears are salivating because it sounds so <laughs> cool. Oh, my God. It was. It was very, very cool. It was okay. amazing. Um, but, you know, I kind of went, that's that's an area I could work in. And then I kind of shelved it, didn't really think about it again. Went off, did my tour, was moving here. And then, ding, at some point after I'd moved here, I went, oh, there's that whole world of motion and performance capture. And so I started to look into it and realized that that's a world I absolutely belong in because particularly with performance capture, which is just, if if people aren't sure, motion capture is where they're purely capturing the motion of the body to feed into the data for the character that you're portraying. Performance capture, they're also capturing the facial movements. They're often capturing the voice. It's the full performance. Got it. Um, I needed that, that education, with... Helen. So thank you for sharing that with me. Okay. I think we all might have. Great. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're doing that with markers that feed data into the system, uh, into the computer system. Right. Um, and, and yeah, I was kind of like, there's a world of performance capture where they need people who can do the subtlety of screen acting. They need uh, people who understand that facial movements, you know, you have to think and feel the movements of the character um, and that has to come through in your face. But they also need people that can kind of keep the body alive because if anyone's done puppetry, they'll know with a puppet, if the puppet goes very still, it kind of dies. 
you have to kind of keep a little bit of breath in the puppet. And it's the same with performance capture and motion capture. If you become very still and that data becomes very, very limited, mm. the character kind of dies. So you have to keep a little bit of movement. And obviously there's also, I mean, performance capture is used a lot in video games to give people a context for it. It's used in all kinds of films and other uh, stuff as well. But video games is somewhere where you'll see it used a lot. And obviously there are huge action sequences and stunt sequences, and, and then they need people to really move. But they also need actors who have that big physical awareness, who can have an awareness of the space, who have big imaginations, because in the, the volume, which is where you shoot performance capture work, you don't have a set. You don't have, you know, if you're, say the scene is set on the mountains, you don't have the mountains, you don't have the blue sky, you might have a hill made out of some boxes, but you have to kind of do all the imaginative work to bring it to life for yourself. So it just became, for me, uh, an area of work that I find very, very exciting that I, I love being in a motion capture suit, a performance capture suit. I love being in the volume. I love what's asked of me there. Um, I've, I've done uh, one major AAA game since I've been here. I've also worked on some other things I can't talk about. Right. Um, That's the, always the, the way major... it is. I feel like every I motion know. capture, performance capture is like, I've got all these things I can't talk about yet, which is makes me excited because it means I know you're working. I know. Um, the, the AAA was Forspoken, in case people are interested, um, which was released earlier this year. And then I also, I got to do motion capture for Henson Studios, which was... As a puppeteer, that was a, a dream. I mean, yeah. both those job, jobs were dreams. Uh, For Spoken was directed by Tom Keegan, who is an amazing video game director. It's just an absolute dream to work with. Um, hence, and I got to play a baby wallaby. And who doesn't want to play a baby oh wallaby? Oh, um, so cool. You know, with yeah. Kermit the Frog overlooking the studio. It's just, yeah. Dreamy. And you shot, did you shoot at Henson Studios on La Brea? Yeah. And you, oh my God, that's incredible. I didn't know, I mm -hmm. forgot that piece. Okay, wait, so I want to take back. Can you connect the, uh, um, so everyone right now who's interested in performance capture, motion capture is probably leaning in really hard right now to hear more of the story. But I want to check in with something because uh, the big major motion picture that you did, was that performance or motion capture as well? Because you played quite the character, transformative character. And I'm going to let you talk about oh. it. Oh, uh, Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children. Yes, yeah. Uh, How, do, the, do the dots connect? I know it's a lot of movement, but do the dots connect at all to PCAP at all? Um, only in a sense of, for anyone that's seen that film, um, there's a there's a sequence in the circus. There's maybe this Jackson. may be a spoiler. This may be a spoiler, but the film's been out long enough. Well, I think it's okay. I, <laughs> I'm not gonna get. I'm not gonna give it all away. But there's okay. Samuel L. Jackson. With some, with three baddies. Yes, I'm one of. The, I'm I'm the female baddie, so yep. people will, people will see me if they watch it. Um, and there's a lot of physical movement and around the space. And um, to shoot it, we did a lot of wire stunts, which I got to do myself, which is amazing. Oh yeah. Um, so there there wasn't it wasn't performance capture, but what it kind of one thing it did was give me that sense of oh. If I'm working in film or if I'm working on screen, the roles don't necessarily have to be ones where I become completely still and everything is from the head up and it all has to happen in the eyes. Of, of course, there are loads of roles like that and there are loads of jobs like that and that's required of so many uh, film and TV actors. But it was just quite interesting to go, ah, oh, there are also jobs where you get to be really physical and you get to jump around and you get to throw yourself off high ledges and that floats my boat. I know yeah. it won't float everybody's. Um, <laughs> and performance capture is more is more like that. That's the world if you're working in performance capture where you're, I guess, more likely to do the let's fight the dragon sequence, uh, let's ride in on horseback sequence um, than you are perhaps in, in some other uh, roles in film and right. TV or some other areas of film and TV. Right. So one of the things oh. that you said, so I wanted to connect to that set. I understand now. So that means when I sing it, you're really wearing all of that makeup and all that stuff is really attached to you. And you're not really, you're, there's no, there's no CGI on top of you, which is pretty exciting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They, okay, great. Well, they, they, they would have had to CGI 
my head back onto my body had the stunt double done the stunts, but I did them myself. So I love it. I love it. Okay. <laughs> so wait, let me go back. I'm going to go back to PCAP because that's where we're kind of stuck right here is in performance and motion capture. So um, what I, one of the things I took away from what you said is I remember I was, was this acting teacher, jo- the great Joan Rosenfeld. She's in New York City. And she said, you know, when you're on TV sets, it's such a joy because if you're used to theater, you suddenly now have a real car door and a real mirror and a real glass. Like you're no longer, there's no more theater pretending that everything isn't around you because on a TV set and also for a film set, everything is actually there. Usually on theater set, like there's a wall missing because we've got a fourth wall going on. Like, right. So on a film set, you have this, you have it there. And so some of that imagination isn't necessarily called upon. And so what I'm taking away from what you said is it's like theater on steroids or that imagination that you use when you're doing a theater where you are, everything is inside your imagination yeah and it's it's this beautiful marriage of um sort of screen acting theater acting and and physical acting because certainly if you're doing full performance capture you've kind of got a camera right here Mm -hmm. capturing your face you've got markers all over you it's getting everything um but you have to have the imagination to see the whole world around you to imagine that that box that you're sat on is the horse or you know the the piece of plastic you're carrying is an incredible weapon you know whatever it is you have to do that imaginative work um and then as i say there's there's so much more movement even in the stiller characters there has to be a greater physicality yeah Yeah. greater something going on so i have a question as i really want to get into the nitty-gritty here so i can imagine when you're on set is the director looking at a screen where they're also seeing the real thing that's in your hand are you having really short takes when you're doing pcat because they're like actually no i need you to reach a little higher like give give us a little bit of like bring us into the volume that's the name of the sound stage right they call it a volume is that how yeah yeah yeah, yeah, exactly exactly no actually the takes are longer you tend to shoot the whole scene at once because you have cameras all around. So you've got the camera on, on on your face right there, but you've also got 360 cameras all around the volume. So they're capturing everything all at once. So it tends to be you run the whole scene, which makes it again, much more like theater. Mm. We're not stopping, starting, turn it around. Now we'll do your close up. Now we'll do the long shot. We, we're doing the whole thing at once. And sometimes you'll see you know, a, a, you'll usually be given a kind of brief of how the character looks. If, uh-huh. you, if you're playing a, a sort of named role, they'll sort of say, oh, this, this is what you're wearing, because it's good to know if you're actually in a massive, long, flowing gown or if you're in tight jodhpurs. You know, you kind of need that information because it affects how you move. Right. Uh, but not always. Uh, sometime on for, sometimes on Forspoken. I mean, I was playing loads of different characters and sometimes they kind of be created on the spot through my movement I go I'm going to be a child in this scene and I'm going to do this movement and and so I'm doing all the imaginative work that the artist will later kind of uh overlay and and look like a a character so yeah it's it's an amazing collaboration between you the artist the director it's it's a really beautiful Beautiful way of working from my oh. point of view. Oh, it sounds so good. So yeah, it's super collaborative is what I'm hearing you say. I'm sure they're not always that yeah. way, but the site you're describing was, and that can be so, I don't know, empowering and exciting because you're like really part of the magic. So uh, tell us, a, tell me a little bit about how you got started in this work and how the first jobs kind of came because I'm sure those people who are listening are like, I wish, I wish. And I want everyone to also know like, Helen and I are also, Helen is a client to this day. We're working together and we're also working on how do we get more. This can sometimes feel like, I don't know if boys club is the right word, but it can feel a little Mm -hmm. like wild west boys club. How do we enter into this market that isn't exactly the same as anything that's already got casting directors and they do this. There's some of that, but we know there's a lot of work happening out there that isn't even in the straight line that acting careers happen. So can you give, give a little wind of how yours started and maybe we can talk a little bit about some of the strategies we came up with after that. Absolutely. And I'm still working this out. As you know, we're yeah. still kind of going, how do we do this? How do we yes. place the chess pieces? Um, so I don't have all the answers at all. But right. um, I think the reason it can sometimes feel like, you know, a, a boys club or, or similar is, is partly because, yes, for some roles, they are looking for something very, very specific. So they're looking for that particular voice, that particular physicality, that particular build, which is akin to, you know, the film and TV acting or theater acting that we we know, um, the way those things are cast. But sometimes, for example, with me in Forspoken, I was playing lots of different roles. And so it wasn't a specific look, type or build. It was 
here's someone we know is good and that we like and that we can hire for this job. And so I think once you get hired, it's possible to then get hired for other stuff quite quickly because people know you and know your work. And I think that happens less in other forms of acting. Now, of course, to a certain extent, there is like this office knows you or, you know, this director knows you. But I think within performance capture, it's it's just possible to be cast because someone knows your work and knows you're available and knows that you can bring something to the table. So you have to kind of get into the networks mm -hmm. in a way that you don't necessarily have to do to such a large extent with um, film, TV and theater. Um, Can I stop you me, real quick? I, I want to stop yes. you real quick because I think I want, I want everyone me. to just hear is it's almost like I can play the cello. Great. I'm going to go look at the actors who can play the cello for this job. It's like I've I've worked with this actor before. If they're and tell me if I'm wrong here, Helen, but like if you're really good at performance capture, if I'm not looking for a specific body type, then I might be able to pick anybody who I know who I love to work with who's really good at performance capture. Not because you're all a monolithic person or they're all your talent is the same, but I, in this world, I can trust if they're good at it, I can probably cast them in this role. So there's not as much maybe differentiating factors to be able to show up with in this space. Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's. I will caveat that's for some of the work. Right. Obviously, there are then roles within games, within things that are being made where they are very specific and they're right. looking specific. We need a six foot four person that's... who's got a really broad chest and that, like that. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Absolutely. And we need the best actor for this. We need the best voice for this, yada, yada, yada. Got it. Um, but I got lucky when I when I first moved here. It was actually, I, I was still, I know it was within the first four weeks of moving here because I remember going to the audition on a scooter and the bus. So it was before <laughs> I had my car. I love it. <laughs> um, I, I just submitted for something on, I think it was Casting Networks. Okay. Um, just kind of submitted for a job and went and did the audition. And they were like, we're going to cast you in this game. You have a job in a game. Now, that game, can't talk about it. it. Unfortunately, it got put on hold for the pandemic and hasn't come back yet. But it gave me four months of experience of working in a volume, of working with performance capture, of understanding the medium practically rather than just from the workshop that I'd done with James Cameron. So it, it was a, it was a gift that I got that even though, totally. you know, who knows, maybe one day it'll come back. We yes, don't know. Right. Um, it was very exciting. Wish I could talk about it. Um, but then from there, when we went into the pandemic, I was like, okay, well, that's on hold. I want more work in this area. Um, I connected with someone who's a dear friend of mine, Victoria Atkin. Anyone that knows about performance capture will know about her. Um, she, uh, she's amazing. We okay. connected. She, Brought me on board to help run some of her classes. She does classes. There's classes for people who want online. to do this work, correct? Yeah, right. Yeah. And through that, that's how I met uh, Tom Keegan. Um, I participated in one of his workshops and was lucky enough that he was like, I need someone like you for this game that I'm making, Got which it. turned out to be for Spoken. So, I mean, that was, I mean, that's a real example of that job came through pure network, network, build, yeah. build talk to people as with so many things, a little bit of right place at the right time. Yeah. Um, but you know, it wasn't but putting job, yourself in the right place. Was... I want to make sure we don't yeah. you put yourself in the right place. And then I just want to check in the job that you, so we'll link to the Victoria's, whatever she, her website or whatever she, the stuff that she offers. Mm. So for those of you who are listening, but I wanted to make also sure like the first job that you booked that you got off of casting networks, when you showed up to set, were you like, Oh, oh here it goes. Let's see how this goes. I don't know what I'm doing here. Or were you like, I think I'm going to know how did can you tell us through that first job? Um, I mean, I, yeah, it was kind of somewhere between the two because I was like, okay, they like me, they cast me, great. And I was like, I I do know what this is right. because of the workshop that I'd, I'd done um, over at Lightstorm. But obviously I was also like, I, I hope I'm going to bring what they need. Right. Um, but then fairly quickly, once I started doing it, I was like, oh, this is this feels like home to me. Mm, this this feels it. like where I kind of belong. Yeah. Um, and that's a that's a lovely feeling because don't we so often, I think as actors, you know, we, we battle to get the job, then we get the job, then we worry about doing the job, then we get on set and then we worry that we're not good enough because nobody's giving us the feedback that we normally get in class or whatever. And, you know, the whole thing can just be like this whirlwind of yeah. 
negativity. So it was really nice just to kind of be like, it's not like everyone was going, oh, you're amazing. It was just like, oh, I, I feel good in this space. And I feel like I know that I am bringing something to the table. Actually, I feel like I don't need validation and not in a mm. big headed way, just in a, this feels like my place where I belong. Uh, I love that. So, so Helen, that's such a good feeling. Do you describe that really, really well, I think. And then, so then, uh, so as people are listening to that, you can see what I like about the story is Helen said, I went to Casting Networks or whatever website we found on. Maybe it was Casting mm -hmm. Networks, right? I think and, it was. Right. And so anyone listening, the act, the auditions that you have access to, whether it's Actors Access or Casting Networks or whatever, there's a reason you have access to them. It means they're probably open to seeing people of different various levels of skill or whatever. And that might end up that those are the great chances to get in the opportunity, which is a great way to kind of underline that. Well, let's talk about, let's you and I just talk about to kind of uh, end this day with everybody, this conversation, because there's so much more we could talk about, but I want to talk a little bit about our like strategy that we've tried a little bit to try to break into this boys club a little bit. If you're down for sharing a little mm. bit of that, can you try that? Yeah, of course. Yeah. And everyone, yeah. we are in process with this. We're going to, we'll have to get back to you someday to let you know how it's working. So <laughs> I brought my typical, if you, if you build it, they will not come unless you tell them about it energy, which is you got to go out there and say, I want to do this work. You have to keep saying, I want to do this work over and over and over again. Um, and Helen cut me off in here or help me make sure I don't miss any steps mm -hmm. here. And so we, Helen found a great resource with a bunch of game, video game production companies. Is that right? Is that what yeah, you're Yeah. Yeah. Most yeah. of them are. Yeah. Yeah. And just, let's just all remember, if someone gives you a list of things, you know, there's going to be email addresses that work and that don't work. And you're going to have to enter through their website. And maybe you're going to reach the mail room. Who knows who you're going to reach if you try to email these people, right? Or it's going to go to some spam bot on their side, right? And we said, well, let's invest in reaching out to these studios with a, we have no idea if we're landing in the right mailbox. Can you direct us to the right mailbox kind of energy, right? I think that's how we did that, right? Yeah, and then, and Helen, you did some incredible stuff along the way, uh, which was redoing your motion capture, put performance capture reel mm -hmm. and created it in a really unique, I, th I think it's pretty cool way where you're narrating your way through some of it, right? And so that they could see that this isn't some Yahoo just saying, hey, I think I can do this. Will you meet me kind of thing? Well, I think because when I was making it particularly, I didn't, I sort of, I'd done the game that didn't get finished, that's still on hold. Uh, I'd done the work on Forspoken, but that wasn't out yet. And so it's kind of like, how do I show people that I can do this work? Um, I also had the Henson work, but I think that wasn't out even at the time. So what I did was I made a reel that said, hey, this is me. And this is, here's very briefly some of the work I've been doing. However, let me show you why I'm good at it. So I then show some of me moving with Cirque, some of me flying through the air, a bit of Miss Peregrine's. And I narrate, as you say, I narrate my way through it going, this is why these skills are transferable to the arena that you person watching right. is are working in. Um, I've modified that reel a little bit now, but it's it still takes the same feel really. And um, and I'm very happy with it because it kind of is like, this is how I'd talk to you if you gave me 90 seconds to yeah. say why you should have me in your studio. I'd go, right. here, this is why. Yes. And I also think what everyone can listen, can hear inside of this is, it, if you start to move into this direction of performance capture, it's going to be a while before you get footage that you're actually allowed to share with the world of you actually doing the thing. And so you got to come up with some stopgap ad hoc version of you showing that I actually know what I'm doing here so that people can believe you. I think you can maybe rest on your credits, but I think seeing you is going to always be so much more powerful. So in our kind of attempt to do this, right, we have this great reel that we love. We have a little bit of story. And then we have basically cold reach outs to these people. And one of the things that Helen, I'm just going to call out your, how I really championing you here is I was like, Helen, oh. I do not think you should be the one to do this <laughs> because <laughs> and here's, let me tell you what I mean to say, do this. So when you're given a big database or you find a big database, like I said, there's going to be email addresses you can find and ones that you can, you have to do a little bit of research. And I'm going to imagine most of the actors listening, all the creatives listening, uh, have pretty busy and full lives. And when you're literally drilling down a database over day after day after day, it's not necessarily the best time spent when you're at the point in your career where Helen is, where 
She's also maybe recording an audiobook or going to an audition, or doing a voiceover, all the things that she does to keep her body in shape, right? For this, right? That this would be the kind of thing to hire someone or if you can't afford to get a little help in this space to get, right? Because what I'm I, so yeah, pleased you pushed me on that. Because yeah, tell us why. My, my, oh, because my natural instinct is, I, again, I think like as actors, we, we so train ourselves to be like in this, I, I don't know if there's ever any money coming ever again. You know, and so even though, I survive very well in Los Angeles. I still have that mindset of like, oh, don't spend where I don't have to spend, which I think is generally quite healthy. But you were like, no, this is an investment in your career. This is about you not sitting there and and getting weighed down with the process of inputting data into a spreadsheet, which for someone else can be a nice little earn something an hour job. But to me would be like, Oh, I'm going, I'm going nowhere. This is killing me. Well, and you you pushed me to to hire someone to do it. And I'm so pleased. For a start, it wouldn't be done now if yes. I hadn't hired someone to do it. <laughs> um, and for a second, my, my headspace around it and around getting that data would be so much more like negative and needy and totally. slow and... Yeah. And what Helen just yeah. said, I want everyone to hear this. So I know that we don't always have the resources to be able to hire someone else, but maybe it can be something where you trade or you put them on tape or whatever it is where you try to get somebody else. Because here's why. The unattached person who's doing this will not have every second thought of, well, should I be doing this anyway? And this person isn't going to like me. And I'm, maybe this maybe this company shouldn't go on my list. And they will not have any of those thoughts. They will get it done because they're doing it to just do it. And so that's where there's the, the, the reason why. It wasn't just because let's throw some money at this. It was, I knew that the mindset mm. of sitting there, because the truth is, I think, Helen, we figured out that like out of a hundred, how many did we actually get? Was there some, how did that work out? Do you remember? Yeah. Uh, I can't remember the exact figures, but it's like something like out of mailing a hundred, something like 25%, there's a bounce back rate. Right. You know, there's a certain amount of automated um, responses. It's only, I, I had a handful of people reply to me and say, thank you. We're now going to put you in a file and, you know, we know where you are type thing. So it's, it's a relatively low kind of return. Um, there's response, no return on investment. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. But I, but I do think, you know, you keep reminding me, this is a long game. This is about building a career over time. This isn't about, I mean, great if it turns into a job tomorrow. Wonderful. Um, universe, thank you. I'd like yes. that. But at the same time, this is also about looking at the long game, taking time, building those contacts, and then keeping on reaching out to them. Yes. And Again, you keep you keep me honest on this because it's so easy for me to fall back into a place of I probably shouldn't bother them because they probably don't want to hear. Quipping so English, like, you know, just quipping being so English, so polite. <laughs> <laughs> I like no, we're sending it, and who cares? And if yes. it's the wrong inbox, they'll just delete. It's not a problem, you know. Yes. Kind of keeping me in that headspace is really good for me. Yes. And so one of the things I want to make sure everyone hears is, you know, if Helen books one job with one of these people, there's no, she'll be paid back for any, any investment she's made. She books anything, Absolutely. Right, right? So we have to kind of put the math that way, more than paid back, I think. And then the other part of it is Helen just tapped into the second big phase of this is it's not a one and done. These people will now hear from Helen maybe every three, four, six weeks will come up with a cadence so that. Hopefully one day she's going to hit the, their inbox on the day that they're looking. Um, and remember, you're not taking up space. You're solving a problem. I mean, you're taking up space, mm -hmm. but I mean, you're not pestering anyone. You're solving a problem. And you're not going in with a uh, desperate voice, which I think is the big change here. So I want everyone just to kind of clock that as an approach. We'll let you know how this goes as we continue to talk about it, right? As we continue to mm -hmm. do this. Um, and Helen, before we go from this conversation today, what has, if you were to say, the big takeaway from being in Los Angeles in your career, what has it taught you just about yourself? Ooh, <laughs> so much. Um, it's been a huge reminder to be open to what comes. Um, and it's funny because I've, I've said that prior to moving to LA, like I never expected to work in the circus. I never expected to be a puppeteer when I, you know, leaving university drama school, I, I, I thought I was going to be a Shakespearean actress that I don't think I've, I think I've done one Shakespeare show in my professional career and coming here, it felt like a, a rebirth almost. It felt like I was kind of starting again. And again, I was like, wow, you have to stay open to the possibilities that present themselves. Of course, 
you know, it's good to have goals and kind of go, I really want to do that. I really want to do that. But along the way, things are going to present and go, what about this? And you don't have to do everything, but I think it's really healthy just to stay open because without that openness, I wouldn't have even applied to do that video game, for example. I would have been like, no, I'm doing film and TV. And kind of just with that openness, possibilities come and, and, and adventures abound. And I love an adventure. So. Yeah. I think that's like the, the the theme of this conversation today. One thing we didn't talk about today, but I just want to p- applaud Helen for y'all, is that Helen has some killer habits that she does every single quarter, mm-hmm. and there are numbers attached to them. And we'll have to save that for a different episode, but I just want to just applaud you for being one of the first clients who I will say that I worked with who really charts said yes to habits and then said yes to charting the numbers of the, so one of the things that I'll just give one little tiny takeaway is I remember Helen, when we were talking about your audiobook stuff, we were like, we need to do this many reach outs every quarter and da, 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 And we figured out actually we can cut that in half and still get the amount of business that you want. It, we think, we think so far, right? That's yeah. right. Yeah. And that was just really exciting to see that, you know, sometimes we put a habit that's bigger than we think it needs to be. And then we learn by time passing as opposed to nothing happened equals that the habit didn't do anything, right? We just kind of stay with yeah. the habit and see what happens. So that's a mini le- little tiny mini habit lesson there. Wow. It's so good for someone like me because I, I love, I love something being done. I love a project being finished. So the habits become, although they're ongoing, they also are like, Check, I did my five reach outs to this area of the industry. Right. Check, I finished that for this month. And it, it makes me feel good and it makes me feel in control of something because I think in this game, there's so much that we're not in control of and that can feel overwhelming. And so to go, well, I can be in control of, as you say, with audiobooks, how many times I reach out to publishers every month. I can do that and I can see it happening and I can chart it. And that for me, for my mindset, that's really useful. Oh, I love it so much. Thank you so much, Helen, for today. I don't want to keep you anymore. You've been here for a while, but I just want to thank you so much for sharing from the bottom, from your openness, like truly. Uh, if you haven't watched this on YouTube, I just encourage you to go over there because Helen is such a delight. Uh, and I know we'll be following along all the PCAP, MOCAP, puppetry acting that you do. Helen, is there places where anybody could um, follow along with your journey that they might want to just see what's going on with you? E- Absolutely. Uh, my website is helendayactress.com. And then my Instagram is littlebird7. Um, that's mostly images of my dog, but I think that's good for anyone to see. So, oh, you know, <laughs> she has an adorable dog. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today, Helen. Of course. Thank you for having me. 